So the, the first, the fir I, I introduced the first speaker as being a student of mine of 30 years ago. The next speaker, Phil Raymond, uh, he was not really my student, but I was his teaching assistant almost 40 years ago uh, at Cornell when I was doing my PhD and he was doing his engineering degree. Um, um, so, Philip is um, an, an entrepreneur and has uh, uh, launched several companies uh, throughout these years. Um, and he's always been a strong advocate of privacy. Uh, his, his last venture being an anti-spam mechanism, um, which had a 100% efficiency. But, uh, and he, in fact, he was here to talk about it. Um, I don't know, about 10 years ago. About 10 years ago, he came here to give a talk about it at the, in this department. Anyways, so uh, without further ado, I'm very pleased to uh, welcome Phil to tell, him, to tell us about his new ideas. Thank you, Gilles. Okay, so in, in Alessandro's presentation just before lunch, we, uh, he talked a little bit about um, the, the differences in how people perceive their privacy or lack of privacy and how they treat that in, 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 in moving forward in a transaction as to whether they're willing to make a trade-off for tri privacy. I'd like to do something very, very similar at the beginning here. I'd like to describe one or two events at which the public had a sudden shift in understanding about the lack of privacy in the marketplace. And to do that, let's roll back Six, let's roll back 18 years, and uh, this is supposed to be a rollback, but I guess it's not. Uh, it, it, you're supposed to see the flips, flips off until it goes back to... I hope all slides don't lose their animation, because this isn't an important one. Anyway, um, 18 years ago wasn't the beginning of the migration of your loss of privacy. But it, there was an event, a very minor event. It made the papers, but it didn't make the front page, and most people forgot about it a few days later. And that minor event played out like this. So we're talking about the beginning of time. We're talking about 1996 before, according to my daughter, anything that happened in the last century is very, very ancient. And we're, there was just you, and there was your American Express card. There was nothing else in the world. This was a very simple world. And you had a problem with your card or with your account or with a purchase you, you, that you saw. So you called American Express for help. I'm not exactly sure why in 1996 you used a phone from the 1930s, but you, you called. And someone, obviously someone in America or North America answered the phone. We weren't doing as much outsourcing back then. And the shocking thing, the thing that changed America and Canada is the very first words that came out of this representative's mouth. She said, can I help you, Mr. Kaminsky? Um, Obviously, that's his name. Obviously, he doesn't mind sharing that information because he's about to call with a question about his credit card. But it was a shocker that the woman knew his name. If you know anything about dialing an 800 number, your name does not go across the, the line. Even your phone number doesn't appear to the person until you hang up. So it wasn't that he was dialing an 800 number. It was that caller ID was starting to spread across North America. So he called, and his phone number was transmitted to her, she has a database from her employer that ties that together. And American Express thought incorrectly, why don't we just save a little time, since it costs time to answer people's questions, why don't we save a little time and pull up Mr. Kaminsky's records in front of the representative? And if you want to take this to the extreme, she might say, are you still living on Oak Terrace? The qualification questions. And is this about your card account with Susie ending in 00? Of course, this guy's wife's name isn't Susie. And he told her that he sold the cabin on Oak Terrace 15 years ago. So the, just the fact that she knew the information, I'm kidding, by the way. But the fact that she knew the information about who was calling was a shocker. Today, this doesn't phase us at all. I mean, Gilles calls me, and his picture shows up on my smartphone before I get the first ring. But it was unexpected, and it was unsettling. And the protest was enormous. American Express lost 3% of people who made a call that month. They lost their customers. They canceled. No survey was done. No controlled study was done. 
But American Express, since 1957, when they were founded, never had a down month in subscribers, and suddenly 3% of their user base disappeared in just the last two weeks of the month. So people were obviously very unsettled by this, and they stopped doing it for the next 15 years. It wasn't until three years ago that they started recognizing your number again. And then the first question they ask is, I see you're calling from the home number associated with your account. May I search your records? May I bring up your records? So they're asking permission for something that probably is implicit, but they're doing it a lot more carefully now. So let's come up, let's move forward 16 years, 18 years. Let's move forward to 2014, and let's invent a company that has a lot more data about you, a company that knows so much more about you, they know more about you than your mother does, probably more about you than, than you do. Let's create a hypothetical company that runs a search engine, an email business. Maybe they have a lab with self-driving cars and glasses and scanning textbooks of the whole history of human writing. And of course, a company needs a logo, so let's just come up with a logo for the company. We'll call the company Gulag. It's a good name for a company. It's better than Gulag. Okay, so <clears throat> Gulag is, a, is, as I said, a hypothetical company, and they have 50 separate products. Uh, it's a big company, and their 50 separate products really cover the gamut of a connected society, an internet-connected society. Um, many of the products that you've heard of from this company aren't even in the 50. They're in what they call their lab. It's not even counted as a product yet. Um, to give you an idea of how much this company can know about you, can get to know about you, and I don't, I don't see this as an evil company, by the way. They're, they're sort of the antichrist to many people. But they're doing something with this data that they claim is helping you, even though you're not their customer. So what are the, what, how are they getting data about you? Well, there's the obvious ways, the ways everyone has already thought about. You use the search engine 40 times a day. Obviously, they know everything you're searching for. They don't need to tie it to an identity, but they have it tied to something much better than, the, than an IP address. Much, much better. They know who you are, and they're building a corpus. They know everything that every one of your friends says to you, because they don't really care about whether you own a Gmail account. They're not turning, typing into data about you when you send mail. They're doing the opposite. They're looking at the mail coming into you, so you don't even need a Gmail account. They're looking at the email coming into you from anyone who uses their products because it says a lot more about your idiosyncrasies, predilections, and fetishes when they can analyze what your friends are saying to you rather than what you're saying to your friends. A lot more information is given out by what people say to you than what you say to your friends. Now with, with Gulag Drive, they have access to your working documents. Gulag Drive isn't a backup service. It is your Word documents and your PowerPoints and your Excels and your, your spreadsheets. And <clears throat> They have access to everywhere you travel if you use, um, I'll call it a Gulag Android phone. Everywhere you travel. And I don't know if many of you are familiar with the controversy and debacle in America. I don't know if it's made its way to Canada, but there's a, a big, big bug in Apple's mac mapping system. And because of that, many people who own Apple phones are running an Android product to do their their navigation. And the Android product, I mean, I happen to be an Android user, is darn good. It can route you around traffic accidents and tree work and potholes and local fire department work, and it's always right. It wasn't six months ago, but it's getting remarkably good. So there's, there's things that I'm benefiting from by using their products. They even know what type of, what type of music I like. Google Play is the same as iTunes. And, and it's, you know, same type of product. And they know my finances, and they know what times I set my alarms on my phone. The privacy policy says that they have access to that. Even what I wrote in the alarm on the calendar when I set the alarm for my phone. So the amount of data is quite staggering. And do people realize they're collecting this data? Well, I suspect most people in this room realize they're collecting this data. But do people understand the trade-off they're making? Do they understand if they're making a trade-off that's to their advantage or not to their advantage? I would submit to you that Gulag has a corporate ethos, an internal mandate to minimize any awareness that people have, just because you don't want to alarm people at how much you really know, but to minimize the awareness of how much people know about their data collection techniques and how much they have. And yet, they 
also aspire to make people aware who care to be aware of all the mechanisms they have for, for preventing certain amounts of data. If you have a, 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 let's stop calling them Gulag. If you have a Google Plus account, there is a remarkable series of controls on the left side of the page. If you go into them, you can remove individual searches you've made over the years and months. You can tell them you no longer want them to collect certain pieces of data. It really doesn't change too much on how much they know about you, but it gives you the feeling of a tremendous amount of control. But if you really do use all the controls, and if you say, I don't want you to collect anything on me, in fact, you stop signing into any Gmail product, and you, you randomize what you're doing, you use Tor when you browse the internet so that your IP address comes in from somewhere else in the world, you actually can make yourself worthless to Gulag, and at some point, they will pr stop offering you services. They'll stop enabling you to do searches as easily because you're withholding so much, it's not worth it to them that you're a customer anymore. They don't do that actively right now too much because few people go to all that trouble to remove that information. But when you think about it, why enter into an exchange with someone who's withholding the data from you? But the main thing that I suspect Google doesn't want you to think about is the fact that you are not their customer. If you're using any of these products, except for AdWords, which is in the middle here somewhere. That's how they, this is how they monetize everything. If you're using any one of their other products, then you're not their customer. Oh, there's some corporate products which they charge for, of course. So you are, what are you if you're not their customer? Any guesses? I'm not their right, you're their product, you're not their customers. You are what they're selling. Now, to be fair, Google doesn't share that information with the person who's paying them. The marketer is paying them. The marketer is someone who has a targeted message. I sell my last, I'll use something as an example from my last field, high-speed disk drive armatures. So I'm interested in that. I want to find the new technologies of people who are interested in that. So I search all over the internet for that information. I occasionally receive and send mail on that subject. I travel to companies that are the companies making the high-tech parts for that product and my travel destinations appear to them. And eventually I start visiting web pages. It could be an eBay page, but I start visiting web pages and the ads that would have appeared on that page anyway, I'm not in control of advertising, the author of the pages, but the ads that would have appeared on that page anyway with garbage that I'm not interested in, you know, women's handbags from Peru, I, it's not my, my market. Those ads suddenly become more relevant to me. I see advertising that makes a lot of sense to me. The, the, distinguish, the distinguishing characteristics between advertising and editorial start disappearing. I find the page content more valuable. To some people in this room, that may sound like heresy. I'm saying that I really want someone tracking and following me so they can shove ads in front of my face, but it is a trade-off that makes my life a little more convenient. And certainly, even if you don't agree with that, if you're using the search engine and the email or the docs feature or the music feature, you certainly like getting the service for free. So they're doing certain things for you. You might argue whether the adver targeted advertising is, is on your behalf, but they're doing certain things for you and they're making money with an incredibly profitable revenue model, $16 million a minute. And, you're, and, and the marketer is getting something. The marketer is getting two things. They're getting their ads put in front of someone who's more likely to interact with those advertising, and they're getting ad metrics sent back to them. Those metrics tell them that you may have an, an ad budget split across various companies. We can prove to you, we, Guleg, can prove to you that the customers you paid for through us, that $2,000 a month you were spending on our AdWords program, is the, why you're seeing an increase in your sales. These many clicks, Sometimes they can even track it through to the purchase. This is what's happening to those ads you're spending with us. So, and I, I don't suspect most of that is new information for most people. So my job today, what I, what I want to make my career, is I'd like to find a way to help online data service providers that cull in private information from you, that take your information. I wonder if there's a way to help those companies do everything they do now. I don't want to impact their revenue model. I want them to make just as much money as they're making now. I don't want to damage their revenue model because if I damage that, they won't want to do what I'm going to propose. But I want to give them a way to demonstrate tangibly that they respect the users, that even though the users are chattel, if you respect them, 
They'll use your products more, they'll endorse your products more, and they won't change their behavior to screw up your metrics. Who is the apple and who is the, the orange? Uh, I'll, I'll, okay, I'll get to that now. So what, what we're looking at here is the different aspects of when, when you assign to someone the ability to be a custodian of your data, and that's what you're doing with Google, whether you're one of the people who recognizes it or what you're, whether you're not. I'm using a food analogy to say there's various phases your data goes through. First, it's harvested from you. It's taken from you. Then, for some reason, oh, there, then, it's, then the data is stored. And storing can be an insecure process, or it can be secure. It could be as, as simple as, is it encrypted when it's stored? Who has access to the encrypted product? Then there's the real manipulation of the product. What are they doing with your data? The product is you, it's the data. What are they doing with it? How are they doing it? In what form can they use it? Does it have to be unencrypted all the time, or can they just unencrypt it occasionally? And the apple and the orange is a comparison cycle. And by that, I just mean, in, it's really part of the manipulation, but in Google's case, it's a very, very specialized process. They need to somehow take that data and compare it with two, two billion other people at the same time to see whether that advertisement is appropriate to put up on your web page. This may sound like a minor or obscure process, but it's everything to Google. It's how they make their money. It, it's the, the biggest revenue engine in the history of my country, and it's, it's got to be protected. They don't want people to know how they do it, but it's remarkably efficient. We can figure out a few things about how they do it, and we're going to do that here too. And finally, and this is a, a tangential comment, I've spent the last two years going around two countries, this country and my country, trying to convince large data services, Yahoo, Bing, Google, Microsoft, uh, trying to, Akamai, I don't know if you know who they are, trying to convince them that there is a better way of taking this data and keeping it confidential and not hindering what you're doing with the data. And in most cases, when I'm shown the door, when I'm told, thank you, but no thank you, it's because of this last thing here. These companies are particularly proud and particularly sensitive to how they age the data, because that's the magic that distinguishes them from their competitors, especially in Google's case. They do a remarkably brilliant job of aging the data. So even though you did those searches a month ago and you drove to these spots a month ago and you wrote about these emails three months ago, somehow those time differences and the activities you did in between and how your mind is changing in another direction affect what they want to show you. And the differences in how they affect it show up in people at corporations who are doing experiments to see should I be using Yahoo's Ovation service or Microsoft's Bing ad service or, or Google service. And even though Google has the lion's share of the market, about 67% according to their statistics, about 95% according to my, my own test, um, it, it doesn't matter to the advertiser. If the price per click or price per effective impression is less with Bing, it doesn't matter if only 7% of the world is using Bing. You'll, you can still use them as your, as your uh, vendor you'll be ending up shifting the market back towards Bing. So Google has to preserve that aggressive lead that they have right now, and they do it through very clever aging. So the apple and the orange is comparison, and in this case, you're deciding which thing are you going to show up to the user when they do a search? Which of these two sites are you going to show up? Unfortunately, it's not which two of two sites. It's which of 300 million sites are you going to show up to 2 billion users. So it's a much more complex calculation. So. How does Google do it now? I'm violating my own rule. I said I was going to call them Gulag. But how does Google do it now? And how am I proposing that they change that? The way they do it now, for anyone who cares to dig into the material, is through the same way everybody does it, through a privacy policy, what's known as a EULA, E-U-L-A, end user license agreement, and terms and conditions. So the privacy policy basically says, we swear on our honor, this is how we're using your data, this is why we're using your data, and this is how long we're going to keep your data. And is it effective? Well, it's been effective to create one of the largest companies North America has ever seen. And it does hold them back in certain ways because there's also a, a reasonable community of people who don't trust them. Is it worthwhile to cultivate the trust of the people who don't trust them? I would say it is. I would say that the problem is if they don't switch their technique soon, some small startup that you've never heard of, maybe a little company in Massachusetts called Vanquish Labs, who knows? Some tiny company will come up with a search engine or a navigator or an add-on that adds 
a, a cryptographic privacy without hindering the revenue model. And it may seem minor, the search engine might not be quite as good, but when editors who are influencers get out there and say, hey, did you know you can do this instead of that, it could seriously cut into their model. So I would say they're a very successful company. I respect them enormously, personally. I'd like to work there. But I'd say that they're on the cusp of a serious, serious competitive threat if they don't change from promises and paper to a more mathematical certainty, a more clear way of doing what they're promising to do with the data. So I guess the, a good question at this point would be, why, why don't we just trust the custodian? If we're changing that, exchanging that data with them now anyway, why don't we just take them at their word and, until we see a major scandal out there? And we're going to talk about some really major scandals. But why don't we just trust them? Before we can answer that question about why don't we trust them, a better question is what are the potential threats? It's not an issue of whether you trust Google or not. That's not the problem. They can be hacked from the outside, about 15% of all the security breaches they've had so far. They can have snooping from the inside. No one has a, a real percentage on that, but it's probably higher than hacking from the outside. They could have carelessness. It's malfeasance as opposed to misfeasance. They can have carelessness where something wasn't buttoned down right because security is a complex thing. Uh, when Google has over 400,000 servers tied in clusters in ways nobody else outside of the company understands. These are remarkably complex systems. And then there's social engineering. I ran an email services company, but 300,000 clients ori originally, a little less than a million at the end. And that's a pretty small email service company when you compare to Yahoo and Google. And we were the source of major efforts to crack us through social engineering. Oh, you must let me into that email. I remember my address. I remember this. My husband died. I'm 82 years old. Help me with this. And it turns out the whole thing was just a competitor of the husband's company or something. It was just all fake. Or the woman was a hired actress. It happens all the time. Now, in the email business, I should say there are ways around this problem. The EFF, the Electronic Freedom Foundation, has a set of guidelines, very, very elegant and clear guidelines. For example, if someone calls your customer support people and gives them a sob story and it's believable and it's an emergency and they must get into a password, it turns out there's nothing we can do to help them anyway. We've already proven to the EFF that we have no passwords on our entire system. So Bob calls me and says, I'm Bob, here's all my proof. Here's my DNA test, my urine test, here's everything. I'm Bob, give me my password. I can't help Bob because I don't have his password, I have a hash. So if he gives me the correct password, I can mathematically be certain that, that that was probably the right password. But without him giving me the password, I have nothing, so I have to go through the security process with him. And it's hopefully better than his mother's maiden name. Excuse At least what, it's his first EFF? dog's name or something what a little is EFF? bit better. Pardon? Could you tell me what is EFF? Electronic, Electronic Freedom, Freedom Foundation. Foundation. And most companies that want to prove to their, to their users that they respect privacy okay. follow their guidelines and rules. Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Electronic what? Frontier. Oh, Frontier. I stand Foundation. corrected. I, thank you very thank much. You. Don't, don't hesitate to correct anyway. me on the mistake. Thank you. Um, and then, of course, there's inappropriate retention policy. Do you believe or do you, uh, do you sign off on the fact that they really saved that thing you did in third grade when your pants were pulled down for that long? I mean, it's, it has nothing to do with your life now. Why should it even be in there? And then there's, of, uh, of course, the whole... Edward Snowden thing and the NSA. I assume even up here in Canada you guys know who Edward, Snow Edward Snowden is. Um, there, there were five previous events, one of them much bigger than the Snowden affair. I have no idea why the Snowden one turned into the press frenzy. But um, there's the issue that the, the government, in, and, and I assume that there's analogous things in Canada, can come in with different vehicles and mechanisms to compel someone who chooses to to say, yes, I'm a patriot, I'm a citizen, I understand the law, can compel them to hand over information. In the United States, we have this problem, and I don't know if you have it here. The National Security Letter is a, is a letter that's sent to you with a few credentials attached to it that say, we require th this information, these searches, th where did this person travel, all this information. We can't tell you why, we can't tell you what, co there is no court that authorizes it, but it's a national emergency. And you are forbidden from telling that person that we're searching for anything on them, and you're forbidden from telling the press how many times we give you that letter. It just doesn't exist. Is but it we need part it. of the Patriot Act? Yes, it's 
part of the Patriot Act. Okay. And it was extended by Obama, who yeah. promised to end it. Yeah, well, it is ridiculous. Right. <laughs> it was extended by a president who, who campaigned on promising to end it. And, and it was supposed to be a big bad thing the Republicans did, and here now the Democrats have embraced it too. Uh, which, you know, I don't want to second guess it. Maybe when the Democrats came into office, maybe they were shown data, look, this is why we needed something like this, and maybe that's why they're doing it. I ran a small email services company, again, less than a million customers, and we got them 16 times a week. We got national, and, and I'm violating US law by even saying that. If I said that in America, I could be arrested. We got 16 of these a week. We refused to comply with every one of them. We did a survey with our friends at Yahoo and CNET and, and uh, Bing, which is Microsoft, and uh, even at AOL. And it's interesting. A few of those companies also refused to comply. Earthlink wouldn't comply with any of them. Companies our size, tiny ones, rarely complied with them. Google complies with them because Google needs permission to do big things in big areas, allow self-driving cars all across California. Seems to be pretty safe. There hasn't been one accident yet. There's already 75 of the cars. But you need permission from people to do things like that. You need to change laws. So Google needs to show that they're making an effort to comply with them. Google will not say how many of them they get, though. They're trying to be more transparent with their users, and they, they reveal these every single month, how many of them they got, how many they complied with. Last year, we had 1,800 subpoenas. This year, we had 2,000 a month. So it's gone up greatly. But the court orders have gone down, and this is what we're doing. And we promise we're refusing 70% of them. We're actually having a person look at each one. About 5,000 requests a day. We're having a human look at each one. We're trying to make judgments on whether we should comply or whether we should fight it. But if they're ordered to, they eventually have to. If a judge is involved, they feel they have to comply. Excuse me. Yes. May I interrupt you? Yeah, what I heard, uh, even if you sue, I mean, big companies, of you've, if you want to complain, they always tell you, go to Delaware. I didn't know that. Yeah, it's a small, uh, you know, small. It's a state. Yeah, okay. it's a state. It's small. Yeah, because uh, I heard because there, they will win. I mean, they have like, oh. uh, you know, like Google, Facebook, and all these big companies. I heard about one of my colleagues who is like a lawyer. He told me they always do all their stuff, like mediation, negotiation, whatever, in I Delaware. I didn't know that. I thought the government would insist on Manassas, Virginia, no. which is where their spy apparatus no, is. No, because I think the, the legacy there is, uh, you know, More biased freedom. maybe <laughs> for yes. them. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So um, it, it, a, a little footnote, not, not important to this uh, presentation. I never complied with it, and I never got in any trouble. And I found out years later, my company is now owned by Google, so I'm not dealing with it anymore. But I found out several years later that the reason I never got in trouble for not complying is because the government can't acknowledge that they gave you the national security letter. So if you don't comply with the national security letter, it makes them very, very hard for them to admit that they gave it to you. And also, if it went to a court, the name of who they're looking for would clearly be public information at that point. So it's so super secret that you can ignore it. That's, that's how, it, how it works in the long run. Okay, so let's get back to the original question. Why not trust the custodian? I think the answer probably won't surprise this audience, my answer. It does surprise, I think, most audiences. Trust should be completely unnecessary. It shouldn't even be a concept. Because if you are telling your data custodian that you need to trust them, then you're creating a liability for them. They are sometimes compelled to work for other people, so you're, you're forcing them to be an investigator, a censor, or a snitch every single time that when they decide if they have to give out something about you, and if they do have to give out something about you in their opinion, or if they refuse to, if they protect your interests, you're making them a non-patriot. You're making them refuse to comply with their own laws, with the laws that are, are in ju their jurisdiction. So I'm suggesting that if the policy is cryptographic and baked in, the custodian shouldn't even want your trust. They should want to prove to you that they've designed a system that doesn't demand your trust. That's a company that I trust, someone who proves to me that they've designed a system that doesn't demand my trust. And um, let's take a look at what really makes a system worthy of not needing trust. It should protect threats both within and outside the company, not just government threats. It should leave the revenue model completely intact, because if you don't let Google make money, then all bets are off. Then there's nothing worth talking about. It should preserve the user inducements, and what, that, what I mean by that is you should 
Google should still be able to give you those free services or charge services or whatever they want. You should still be attracted to those services. It should still, the matching sh should do something of value to you. The driving should do something of value to you and all their products. And the most important one, or the most in, unobvious one, so it's most important to list, is it should absolve the custodian of all liability. Now if the custodian can say, aha, see, I just decrypted this, it's not the data you want, and if it looks like it might be believable, that's not absolving them of liability. That's plausible deniability. I said immunity, I meant plausible deniability. That's sort of good, but that doesn't solve the problem because if it's found out later that they lied and they, were just, they just had the technical means to lie, they could still be in trouble. Absolving them of all liability means that I want to design a system where the feds can walk into Google's property saying, I want this information on Esme. She's a terrorist. We, have, we, we don't trust her. We have, we're not going to show you the data, but it's a national security letter. I want to know, did she drive here? What was she searching for? Give us, there must be a corpus on her. To which Google says, well, of course there's a corpus. We have to serve up advertising to her. She's been a user of our products for 11 years. Give it to us. We can't do that. Gun to the head. Give it to us. Okay, okay, here's Esma's file right here. It's got everything you want in it, and here's the keys to it, the private keys. And the government takes the keys, they open up the file, and guess what? There's nothing intelligible in there at all. Nothing even Google can make sense of. There's nothing of any value at all. So why is it there? Because it works for very specific processes if those processes have honorable intentions according to an agreement between the user and us. Anything else we try and do with that data won't work. How can you design a system like that that knows the intent of a process? It's possible, and you're going to know in the next 20 minutes. So, um, I originally, I'm going back to my cover slide, because originally I said this is the, the search for custodial privacy assurance. Yes? So, yeah, I just have a small question. So, do you also assume that it's not possible to get the personalized advertisement that Esma will... Uh, it's not possible to what? So there was some people that show that from the personalized uh, advertisement that you receive, it's possible to uh, recreate part of the profile that has been used. So do you also imagine a system where you can show as a company that you don't have uh, the profile of Esma, but also it's not possible for you to run and to generate advertisements that would correspond to this profile? I'm not sure I understand the question. So you, the profile is used to compute some personalized uh, advertisements. It's used to help decide what will be targeted back towards you. Yeah. Yes. And so my uh, question was, is it also your system will be such that it's not possible to also know the advertisements that were sent to ESMA? Because sometimes just from the output of the process, which is the advertisement, you could reconstruct the profile itself. Right, so you can fingerprint someone based on behavior. I don't see how that... Right now, I'm, when, when they will, oh, I, I, I see your question now. I see your question now. Uh, yes, so that, will also, be, that so will also be completely scrambled and useless. Okay, so uh, my question is because uh, some people show that from uh, the personalized search results that you get from Google, it's possible to reconstruct a part of your history of navigation. We're going to so talk uh, about that in a three, three or four slides. We're going to talk exactly about that. So I think, I think the first question, though, Sebastian, I think the first question was, it, it, is it, is it also protecting and giving immunity to data on what on, on behavioral stuff that might have come in through the through thir, through through the algorithm? And the answer is yes, it does protect it. And we're going to get into your second part in a second. So what I'm what I'm going to change the name instead of calling this the search for custodial privacy, I'm going to be more specific. We're looking specific. We're looking for a privacy methodology that supports blind back channels while removing any need to trust the custodian. The back channels. Are, are really key here because this is why I was kicked out of Google after being invited to explain to them why this might be helpful. I didn't understand how important this was to them so I didn't articulate why the back channels are preserved. That's why I believe I was kicked out. So the primary channel of information, and I'm not sure if I'm using the proper tr terms of the art for uh, cryptographers or mathematicians, the primary channel of communication is that the user signals the world. I'm interested in disk drive armistice. I'm interested in bottles of Viagra or whatever they think you're interested in in all these ads. You're signaling the world with what you do, what, you, what, you, what your interests are, what your hobbies are, what you like to do. 
Back channel number one is some information comes back to you from a third party. And by the way, Google doesn't tell the third party who you are. They just send it themselves. But it's highly targeted. It's better information than you would have seen, more relevant to your needs than would have happened otherwise. And that's everything the customer's paying for. And then back channel number two is Google won't make nearly as much money if they can't give metrics back to the advertiser to prove to them that a large percentage of the people they showed those ad to did something meaningful with it. Otherwise, they might as just blast the ads through spam because it wouldn't be meaningful to them. So the key is preserving those back channels. That was the it was it was the last thing on one of those other slides that I did. So we're going to look at five technologies, and we're going to a couple of them will run through and dismiss pretty quickly. I came up with a list of two things other people have done and three things that I'm giving names to and proposing to solve the problem. And again, the problem restated is we want to give Google a tool to let them prove that they're good guys to their users, even though their users are not their customers. Because without their users, they won't find customers. We want to give Google tools to prove that they respect their users. That's simply stated what we're trying to do. So. Um, the first, uh, and, and, and we're going to see if these techniques work by testing them against these conditions. And it's the same conditions that I showed you two slides ago. Does it protect threats inside and outside the system? For, does it protect your data from both people at Google and from the government and from carelessness and from hackers? Does it leave their revenue model completely intact? Does it preserve the user features and benefits? That's what I'm calling the inducements. And does it completely absolve Google of liability if they refuse to cooperate in any future investigation? I mean, I could think of a really, really obtuse net effect of this. I guess the government could come into Google saying, if that's how your system works, if your data is that well protected and designed, then we order you to design a less secure environment. I guess they could, I mean, in theory, they could, they could complain and give them some liability by forcing them to design a weaker system. But... That would certainly make the government the bad guy. That's exactly. The clipper chip, the uh, key escrow accounts, the embargo against uh, Phil Zimmerman, the guy who created PGP. So the government does have a history of trying to force companies to, to design weak systems. Very good point. I hadn't thought about that. Yes. I forgot about that. Okay. So um, I am not a mathematician, even though I, I have friends who are mathematicians. And I am not a uh, cryptographer. I, I, I was at, at one point an engineer, and I do have degrees in engineering. But um, I'm not great at math. You won't see a lot of this here. And you certainly, you certainly won't see that here, because it has nothing to do with this presentation. OK, so we've got these four candidate methodologies, five candidate methodologies. The first one, I, is anyone here in cryptography other than Gilles and anyone? So oh, we really do have, wow, OK, we got five, six, seven cryptography people. That's very good. Um, yes. Oh, OK. So um, homomorphic encryption was created by a graduate student named Craig Gentry. And over the last, it was created about five years ago. It was proposed. And then it was developed into an art. It's become a hot topic lately. IBM has just four months ago released an API and a toolkit that lets anyone play with it. Homomorphic encryption, in a nutshell, and again, it's, not my, my, it's way above my pay grade, is a, a, a construct that allows you to take an encrypted body of data to perform operations on that encrypted body of data without ever knowing what's in it, to set conditions, perform operations on it, and then produce usable results that actually achieve what you're trying to do without ever having seen the data in the first place. And throughout the process, the data is never decrypted, not even within your process. It sounds to me like magic, but it's real, and it's working. And Craig now works for IBM. He's no longer a grad student. And IBM has just released products with this feature in it. <clears throat> I don't think I would be hurting my reputation with Craig if I pointed out that virtually everyone, including Craig, has acknowledged that it is an extremely cost intensive. It takes scores and scores and scores of supercomputers to do very, very minor tasks. So at least at the time being, it's not useful to what we're trying to do. And homomorphic encryption also fails our tests because the people who collected it 
do have keys. They did encrypt it somehow, and there's no way for them to prove that they can't decrypt it. So it gives them the ability to work on the data and stop carelessness, maybe, from seeing the data, but it doesn't give them the ability to prove that they can't decrypt the data. You s everyone s see the subtle difference there? Okay, so that brings us to honey encryption. This, this uh, definitely I'm losing my animation. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so <laughs> honey encryption was developed much more locally to where I live. Ari, uh, uh, Craig actually was, was originally was on the West Coast when he did homomorphic encryption. Ari Jules is also at MIT, and he developed something called honey encryption. Honey encryption has a fascinating backstory, and it just hit the press one month ago in the IEEE Spectrum magazine. That's the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers. So the next four slides are, are yellow because Ari gave me the slides. So this is not my work, this is Ari's work. So in 1943, there was a German agent. This is, this is two years before the end of World War II. There was a German sleeper agent living in a Spanish fishing village. Spain, like Switzerland, was neutral, or so they said, during this part of the war. They were not taking sides with the Allies. And the German agent's job was to get as much intelligence as he could from a neutral country. He would be too obvious if he moved to Great Britain, but inside Spain, and especially since he spoke and had Spanish inflections, the, his job was to stay covert and get as much information as, as he could, keep his ears up in case anything was going on that would help the Third Reich. And while he was living in this village, uh, about a month before this picture was taken, a small boat of the Royal Navy was seen to have an accident offshore, only about two miles, but visible to, to fishermen and to various people, and the boat sank, and none of the people on the boat were recovered. It was a small boat. There were assumed to be eight British officers on the boat, but it sank, and everyone was assumed dead. It was it made a local splash in the pran Spanish press. And then, a month later or so, a body washes on shore, consistent with a month of decomposition. There was fluid in the lungs, salt water in the lungs, and the body is wearing a Royal Navy uniform, and a pretty high-ranking one, too. I mean, right up there at, at the Queen's level. And a satchel was found less than a kilometer from the body, also floating in the water and starting to move towards the shore. And because of the way the satchel, ha satchel had been folded several times, the letters inside and the documents were reasonably preserved and could be, with a little bit of forensic analysis, could all be read. And most of it was letters from his fiance. There was an engagement ring uh, receipt. There were letters back and forth to his father, who was living in the States at the time. And it was a very interesting set of... Uh, this is jumping past. Okay, so the body was a British Royal Marine captain. Spain was neutral. I already said all this stuff. And he was hand-carrying letters. The Germans knew that the Allies were planning a major, major attack. This was coming closer to the ba major battles in the war, liberation of France, liberation of Italy, liberation of, of uh, and finally, the invasion of Germany. Um, the Germans knew that the first of these major attacks was being planned, and it was at a peace it was at a time in the war where the Germans had shown some weaknesses. And the letter that he had in his bag, actually, this doesn't do it justice. The letter said, Dad, please stop begging me for information about my risk and what I'm doing and where I'm going. I shouldn't be telling you this, but we are about to do a major invasion of Greece. And please stop. I'm an officer. I'm not allowed to be discussing this matter with you. He described the invasion of Greece. It looked like he had torn up pieces of it and decided it was too risky to mail the letter. A lot of stuff was going on here in his thinking. Who knows what he was thinking? He died on this little boat. But Hitler got enough information from the German sleeper agent to realize that the Americans and the British and the French were about to mount a major attack and were about to come into Greece. Well, the, I don't know if Enigma was before or after this, but that was dealing oh, with... Oh, I mean, I call Gilles. Enigma was... Uh... Yeah, yeah, but that was dealing with decoding messages okay. to submarines. Okay, yeah. okay. okay, that was and also that was Pacific. So anyway, the Allies did not invade Sicily at all. They didn't invade Greece at all. They invaded Sicily. And here's a piece of information I'm particularly proud of. These three pictures are my father, who was who was in the first wave. He had 110 men under his command, and he was in the invasion of Sicily. And there was very, very little resistance because the three Panzer divisions, with all of Hitler's real intelligence and power, were all waiting in Greece for the attack. And there was some resistance. My dad's own plane came back with half a wing. But it did manage to land, and I was born 10 years after the war. So thank God. Yes. 
And this, this is actually in Sicily. My father's in a field of potato mashers, which is uh, German hand grenades. They look, like, they look a little different than the pineapples the American use. These look like a little can on a stick. And he didn't know that they were live when he was playing around having his buddy take pictures of them. When he left, he went ahead and tossed one back there, and a whole section of the pile blew up. But anyway, um, I, 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 I promised the conference organizers that, there, that I would actually mention Algiers and... Greece and, Germ and Germany all in the one slide, and that's the slide. And anyway, so what, what really happened here? And what does this have to do with Google? <clears throat> Nothing at all. I just thought it was a fun diversion. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, that's right. Dad, I hope you're listening. So the Allies invaded Sicily. The captain, it turns out, never existed. There was no British captain. In fact, the boat was a decoy attached to a submarine that made it look like it was in an accident several months earlier and then just went below water and returned to Great Britain. There was no boat that had an accident. The body was a homeless person who was found dead with, and, and they filled his lungs with fluid consistent with saltwater decomposition for a month. So the real piece of information and the only useful piece of information that the Americans and the Brits had was that they knew a really good detective working for Germany was living in this village and was supposed to gather information. That's the only piece of information they had, and they used that information against the Germans. So he was, he was the honey. He was the lure to try and get Germans to change their behavior based on finding a piece of information. Everything was fake, even the love letters and the receipt, and that beautiful part about Dad, stop asking me about the fact that I'm about to invade Greece. Right, it was misinformation. I call it digital chaff. Now, interestingly enough, it must have been a very low-budget movie with bad actors because it didn't make very much of, of waves. Even my own family has never heard of the movie, but it's on IMDb, and a movie was made about this, The Man Who Never Was. And um, the operation in Wikipedia and in the history books today is well known. It's called Operation Mincemeat. But, and it is widely, I mean, not just by my dad, it's widely credited with saving 40,000 lives. I mean, it would have been another major beach disaster if we had, if we had not had this decoy. And, um, and someday I'll, I'll see the movie and see how, how much it relates to Google. Okay, so I'm going to rule out honey encryption. What honey encryption does is exactly what the Americans and Brits were trying to do. It takes a body of data and allows someone who is being caught at the border with a laptop and uh, the gun to the head metaphor I see that you have a large set of random numbers in this huge file that you've named mysecretdata.txt. <laughs> well, you're hiding it in plain sight, right? I want you to go ahead and give me the key, or I will take your laptop, and I will also take you to court. And so you give them the key under duress, and what they find out is it's your tax returns, or it's your pornography, or who knows what it is. But they, what they don't know is that your state secrets require a different key. The things you're really transporting across the border to your agents requires a different key. I should say this. This, is, this idea of a decoy is not new. I love using TrueCrypt, which is an open source product anyone can use, and it supports nested encrypted containers. So you have an outer container. Everything, when, when you encrypt a volume in TrueCrypt, you tell it what your largest size is going to be, and everything's random in that. Your whole disk can be random. Everything has random numbers in it. And then you give someone the key. They see your tax returns. Little do they know that within that container is another container. It, to them, it looks like the buffer at the end of your file. I haven't filled my file yet. That's why there's more numbers out there. But actually, the other half of the file contains your internal encrypted data. So having deceptive data isn't, or a deceptive key isn't new. What Ari did, which is, I think, truly fascinating, even though I'm not a mathematician, it amazes me, is he came up with an ability to stick in multiple streams of what looked like useful information. And it exceeds the entropy of the file length. At least it apparently exceeds the entropy of the file length. So if you have a file that compressed should yield 10 pages of text, after accounting for what you know compression can do to text, it should yield 10 pages. He can give you a file where you have three different keys and you have 10 pages that have a Shakespeare sonnet and 10 pages with Winnie the Pooh and 10 pages of your secrets. And it's, it's brilliant. Of course, it has something to do with the key, too, that it can produce all that, but it's, it, it's brilliant. But it's useless to us because it, is, it, it, it doesn't create 
it creates a little bit of deniability, but it doesn't create full custodial immunity. And again, I'm, I've miswritten this. It creates plausible deniability, but it does not create custodial, custodial immunity. I want to say that again. It creates plausible deniability. I really don't have it. Here's my key. But it does, that's not a truthful statement. We've got to let Google tell the truth when they're forced to comply. And the truth is, there's nothing here of value to us because we don't understand it. We have no idea how that user got that marketing message. We have no idea how the ad metrics got back to that advertiser. And that's the truth. And yet we're aging the data and something magic is happening to the data. And the data can only do what we promised the customer it can do. It can't be used for any other purpose, even if we peek inside of it with our private keys. That's the goal here. So um, I spent embarrassingly two years of following a path, uh, I'll call it chasing a rabbit down a rabbit hole, that I call adding encrypted back channels. That's what, what I thought would be the best way to solve the problem. And it's, it's still illustrative. And again, I don't know if this is skipping. No, it's good. So before I tried to figure out if there's a solution to this, I tried to figure out how does Google do its data matching services in the first place? How do they do the magic they do? Now, obviously, it's going to be a trade secret. They're not going to willingly share. Only this month they're starting to share with me how they do it because they're starting to get interested in the work. But the, the truth is they're not going to share their jewels because their jewels are what keep them competitively advantaged. So we can't know their trade secrets, but it turns out there's a classic art called boundary testing that lets you do a tremendous amount, gain a tremendous amount of insight into how Google does what they do so remarkably well. So you've got a user who at some point, the way boundary testing works, by the way, do you all know what boundary testing is? Okay, so the way boundary testing works is you don't know how this box works. You have no idea how the magic works. Somehow you've done some searches and somehow much better ads come out. But what if you can do control testing environments? So you, do, you set up a million searches from all around the world, you age those searches, then you do more searches that add more statistical variance into it, and you watch how that changes the results. So you're outside of the box, but you're able to make some inferences by the data. I was involved in a small project, small, meaning about 10 million searches, where we were, we were testing just to figure out, does Google need to keep this data unencrypted all the time? Or can they go to each person and, unencrypt their, and encrypt their data? Because there's a cost with data encryption. And what we came up with was a statistical model, me and a friend, when I say we. We came up with a statistical model that said it appears what they're doing is they're setting up a polynomial equation. The equation, I'm using a very, very simple example on here. This is not a search. This is a person who has done a search at one time, and their search was Yankees or Mets, which are two baseball teams in New York, for those who don't know, and tickets and home game. That's the only search he's ever done. He's a one data point custom user of Google's. And then later, we're trying to figure out which advertisement is Google going to give them. They're visiting a web page. The web page is Googlefied. It's a, the, the web page owner is a partner of Google's. They're, they're buying into the AdWords program. And they're showing Google's, Google, they're letting Google control their advertising real estate. That's all that means. They're letting Google control their advertising because if they went out and said, hey, we run a web page on uh, you know, visit, getting to see a white polar bear in Manitoba. Come and do our Manitoba buggy tours and you have a high chance of seeing a white bear. Now, I have a friend who runs an educational website on polar bears and they actually sell ads from that page to companies. But if you're in a typical business, it's much letter, better to just let Google run your ads. They're going to bring you the exact person who should, who should you're, they're going to bring your viewers' eyes to the exact ad they should see and give you part of the money for that. That's how AdWords works. Google brings the right person's eyes, they bring the right ad to your page. They don't attract people to your page. Google doesn't attract people to your page. But the people you're attracting anyway see things that help you monetize that page. Got it? If you have a popular page, Google lets you make money, even though you're not doing anything you would think would make money. So this person searched for one word, and what happens is when they go to a page in a, in a very short order of time, hopefully before the page, did I, did I confuse anyone? I see a lot of confusion out there. Okay, so in a very short amount of time, 
And this is real time. This is before you finish viewing the page, because it's, it's not that page that has ads about seeing polar bears on the buggy tour. It's that page for you that sees an ad for a polar bear, because you're going to Manitoba next week, and you're going to be in the area where the polar bear tour company is. It's that targeted. Think of what that does to information. Think of what that does to value. I mean, I am a privacy zealot. I, it bristled my hair on my neck to think that Google has this data about me. And today, I think if I could be reasonably certain that they're using the data in the right way and couldn't misuse it, I think I, I like that exchange. I like the fact that real estate is more targeted to my needs. So anyway, an equation is set up that starts bringing points that starts identifying points. These are advertisers, and these are their identifications and how much money is left in their account. It brings money. It brings it brings up an, an array of distances, and the and the potential how much how much pull you have in these distances. Think of it as stars and the gravity from stars and its influence on you. And you start see, trying to see which one of these you should be grabbing. How hard is the equation? I drew it two dimensionally here. I drew it three dimensionally here. Our best guess says it's a 24th order polynomial. Now, for those of you that know a little bit about mathematics, it's pretty much impossible to solve once it's past fifth or sixth order. At least it's impossible to solve while the page is painting itself. But Google has some very, very bright people. I don't think they're solving the polynomial. I think they've got a set of sieves, a set of estimation devices that let them quickly find what is likely to be the thing you're looking for, the thing that you should be looking for, and then quickly identifying which ones they're going to throw up on your page. They, it is very repeatable, and it's very accurate, and surprisingly accurate. You can come up with some very obscure searches, and the more obscure you are, the more accurate it is, obviously. So this is a model that seems to produce the same results Google does for, single, for people who have one data point in their lives. Is it accurate? I don't know. But the exercise was worthwhile because it scared the hell out of me. The exercise said to me, whatever Google's doing is extremely complex. It's probably a trade secret protected better than the NSA can protect their own documents. And here's the really tough piece, the tough thing for me to deal with. That's just one user. Google has almost 2 billion users. And all of them, all of those people, might need that ad. And all of those advertisers might need any number of those people. So how can I say I have to go to this person and decrypt their data? It doesn't make sense. Some hash or some value associated with their data has to be live all the time in a fluctuating gravitational field of billions of stars. And it has to be always on and live or it won't work. So uh, am, I am I running out of time? OK. So. <clears throat> Um, let, let's first define what it is the data is. The data is your personal thoughts. I mean, that's really what Google's after. They want to know what makes you, you. And Google doesn't really make a direct effort to figure out who you are, but they do want to make sure you're the same person they think you are from time to time to time. They want persistent tracking of a non-identity metric about you. Well, that may be good for Google, but the point is the data does identify who you are, whether Google wants to or not. I've tried to indicate that by the heads and feet sticking out. But what I really, I call that the tell. And if you, and, um, you were listening before to an analogy of sleight of hand in mathematics, the tell it refers to some little idiosyncrasy or behavior you have that gives away your next poke, whether your poker hand is good or bad. You always rub your finger every time you have four aces or something. So how does data do a tell? Well, um, there were famous tell uh, compromises, very famous ones, with these four companies. I'll just give you one example, the AOL example. example. See, I know how to use the laser pointer here. And the AOL example is, uh, is truly stunning. I don't know how many people remember that AOL was, uh, was the... Um, information. Right. But not intentionally. They were trying to be good guys. AOL was the, uh, the Verizon or the Comcast of its day. They, everyone in America got onto the internet through AOL shortly after the demise of CompuServe and, and Genie and Delphi and Prodigy, but just before the new big companies. And AOL was beseeched by a university. It was part in Tennessee, part in Champaign-Urbana. And they were begged, we need to do a major statistical study. We need a massive database. 
we want to work with your database of all searches that have ever been done. And AOL said no for almost a year. Privacy, no, we're not going to do it. And finally, some senior professor convinced AOL, don't you have the ability to strip out all identifying information? And AOL said, okay. And they, they wanted two million or three million searches. AOL said, actually, we found a clever way to quickly remove all identifying information. We're going to replace every identity with a random number. So yes, we'll give it to you. And by the way, two million records, forget it. We'll give you the beginning of history to time all the way till now. You'll have 12 billion records. So go ahead, you can have the information. That data file is less than a quarter of a terabyte. Now today, you can buy a one terabyte drive for 50 bucks. That's it, 50 bucks. So this is $12 drive can hold this file. I have the file. And many people have the file. Many people have played with it. And it's true. There's nothing in there that says that this is Gilles Brassard on these searches. Oh, but it's so easy to figure out. In fact, one company made it easy for a script kitty company, made it easy for anyone to find out who it is. Let's say that your father is 89 years old. And let's say he owned a company in Chicago for 30 years called Silver Beauty Corporation. And let's say he flew in the invasion of Sicily. And let's say that his wife had ovarian cancer. So he searched for these things in a fairly short period of time. I wonder if I'm on the internet. What about my old buddies at Silver Beauty Corporation? And can I find anything about doctors in Laguna Beach area on ovarian cancer? It's not that hard to figure out that it's my dad doing these searches. And what's that about searching for Gina Lola Brigida in the bikini? And so all that other stuff just starts rising out of it once you know who does the search. So a lot of information can be given out even though you never intended to. Yes? Oh, okay. Okay, so, um, and I think I am down to the last five minutes, but here comes the critical part. So I started working on how can I create an enclosed environment where all this stuff can happen. I have on one side of the room, uh, this is, think of this as a junior high school dance. On one side of the room, the, the users are coming in saying, this is what I'm interested in. Here's my interests. This is what I look for in a boy. Is it sexist? I don't think I'm saying anything sexist here, but if I am, I'll use another analogy. I'm using you guys as my test group. This is what I'm looking for. You better meet these conditions or I'm just not interested. And on the other side of the room, you have walking in all these marketers who say, I offer these advantages. I offer these products. I'm doing this. And in this room, people can mix. And the different doors are the different IP addresses, or better yet, the different statistical fingerprint that identifies you as a unique person, persistency, from time to time. And the room fills up, and everyone dances and mixes and pairs off, and eventually, I'm looking for someone who knows 72,000 RPM disk drive armatures, and this company is inventing a brand new one, and I, I did that backwards, I'm, I'm the girl. And so eventually, a, a, a marketer, <laughs> A marketer pairs off with a user and they say, this match is made in heaven, I need your data, I actually like your data, I'll click on it, I might even buy it. And these two people are very happy. And I started coming up with a construct because, because the mathematics of hashing says that if, if, I can support, if I can support authentication in one direction and confirmation in another direction, if I can send information in one direction and at least get a confirmation in, the, in another direction, I should be able to build a statistical model that lets me add the back channel information back in. That's what I was pursuing for two years. I should be able to build a model that allows me to get the data to the marketer outside of the room and still come back into the room later. So I was trying to find a way to keep this data private and I started developing this system. There's a door check person at every door. He hands you a random number the moment you walk in. When you leave the room together to present the advertisement, your two numbers go through a one-way hash. Now you have a number that's meaningless to anyone else, and you can do your magic. You come back into the room. You meet up with the first door check person. You get something that lets you recover your original identity. I'm sitting here trying to think, is a mathematician going to even understand my crazy idea? Is my idea even valid? And I finally gave up. The lesson I learned from this is the math of signaling suggests that it should be possible, I still believe it should be possible, to send information in all directions but protect everyone's identity and their data. The lesson is that in a hot environment, that environment with a 24th order polynomial, it's a daunting task. And so I figured if it's going to be that complex, my solution, it's not going to be secure. Because you create a solution that complex, you're not secure. So what I, what I concluded is that we need a much bigger trusted environment. We need something in which 
the private data is completely meaningless all the time unless the purpose of looking into the data, unless the purpose is authorized. So I've ruled out all that work I did for all that time, and I'm going to put the last two together quickly. So there's, a, there's an art that was developed in 2002 and 2003 called trusted computing. And trusted computing doesn't directly address our problem, but it turns out it's the missing link. It's the key that allows us to solve our problem. The trusted computing group, lots of information on the internet under that name, created a methodology. It's an ISO organization, a certifiable organization. They created a methodology called TPM. TPM, I, I tried to avoid acronyms in the presentation, so you won't see it here. TPM means the Trusted Platform Module, and it's inside every laptop computer that costs more than $1,000. Hasn't made its way down the chain yet. But any laptop computer over 1,000 from Dell, Lenovo, Toshiba, Sony, has this chip in it. The chip is a burned-in hardware cryptographic processor. It's not really a processor. It has the ability to manufacture private keys on demand under the control of a data owner. That's what it is. So with trusted computing, or TPM, or the software equivalent now, now they can do it in software, it's called TXT, Trusted Execution Technology. You can have data owned by one company. You can have data owned by another company. You can have a process owned by a third company. I'll give you an example. You can have an iTunes song that belongs to the Beatles. And you can have the music player that belongs to Apple. That's the player that's going to do something with the song. In this example, I have two pieces of data I'm working on. And even more interestingly, you can have the output that comes out. In the case of music, the analogy breaks down. It's just sound. But you can have the data that comes out of this process be also cryptographically contained so that even the owner of the computer can't see it, only the data owner that paid for that manipulation on two parts of data. So there's many applications for trusted computing. If you rent a mailing list, but you need to take possession of it because you don't want the mailing list company to have your communication, you can, you can rent the mailing list without ever seeing it, and another printing company will cause your form letters to print out, and you're not allowed in the printing company. All sorts of interesting things can be done with trusted computing. It's, it, what trusted computing does in, in, in clear English is it bifurcates, it separates the data ownership from the process ownership, from the hardware ownership, from the results ownership. It separates all those things. So I started thinking to myself, if you can separate the private keys for the data and, and the process that runs the data and the person who gets the results, why don't we just design a system that separates the goal of computation? That is, I'll allow any process that ethically meets my judgment of goals. So I'm getting a little closer to what I promised you. I'm describing a mechanism I'm going to use. I'm going to use a trusted computing model to solve the problem. But I'm still leaving one mystery here. How am I going to know that something meets the goals? And those are the two acronyms I said I did not include in the presentation. So I'm also not to be trusted. And um, I, I, I phrased it through three slides because it is not an obvious process. Trusted computing says, in, in a, a third way of saying it, you can possess the private keys to something you can't get to, and that the encryption applies to the execution policy, not just the data. Is this environment what I want before I allow the execution to take place? A SIM card in a phone is a very similar thing. Everyone talks about unlocking a phone, hacking a phone. They're unlocking features, and the, and the, the, the wireless company wants you to actually unlock those features and violate their policy. That's not the problem. But no one ever unlocks the subscriber identity. It hasn't been done. No one's actually cloning the phone to the point of stealing minutes from another piece of hardware unless they've stolen the SIM. It's a very valid technology, and it works. So it's a controversial technology, too. Um, to I was ahead. warned by one of the people here in this conference, watch out. This is not considered great by privacy people. And I did a little researching into that, and it's very, very true. It's not considered great. Because back in 2002 and 2003, when it was created, it was seen as the recording industry trying to decide what you can run on your computer. Someone else owns the data, and you can do this or can't do that. Personally, I don't think it's very effective for that, because if you can hear it, if you can see it, you can scrape it off the screen, you can always redigitize it, you can always get the data back. So I don't even think it's effective Did as a digital rights management system. You have to conclude, please. <laughs> okay. So um, I don't think it usurps ownership. I'll, I'll get right to the point. I'll get right to the point. Um, 
I think that when you see PowerPoint presentations, the amount of animation is inversely proportional to the importance. So don't believe anything from anyone who fills you up with special effects, but ignore that rule on this next slide, because a little animation was necessary. This is this will be my next to last slide. Let's take that dance hall model and let's change it a little bit. Let's move the border of the trusted boundary all the way out to the outside of the world. Let's move the border to, your, to include your computer. So the data can be always available to do what Google does with its big fancy equation, but the data is meaningless for all other purposes. And the way you do that is you take a key server in an, and you put the key server anywhere on earth you want. It can be right here in Montreal. But what you do is you put the authority over that key server divided among a voting trust. So you have, you have Google allowed to use authorized processes. They've already proved it to, uh, uh, to, to representatives of their users. They've proved to five or seven representatives of their users, elected by their users, you're allowed to go in and vacuum up my data. But before Google can change the process or add a new process, which they do about 12 times a month, before they can go in and change the process or add a new process, they have to go to a voting key server. A voting key server says, before I authorize that new process to run, in other words, to see any of this, this data, I have to have at least five of seven people in different countries, Germany, Australia, Brazil, Canada, at least five of seven people who represent your users must look at the code. They must, there is a human involved. They must look at the code and they must decide, is this process meeting what you promised your clients? So that's the key slide of how I'm using trusted computing. By using a voting key server for the process server, I've changed the trusted computing model to no longer checking who owns the data or who owns the process, but who owns the purpose that the data was being written for. That I'm going to end a little early, but does Thank anyone have, have a... Does that make sense? Does anyone not understand the main Thank point? you very much, Raymond. Okay. So we have a few minutes for questions. So, any questions? Okay. Microphone? Um, micro Can you give the microphone there, please? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, my question is, um, I, I don't know if you're aware of LavaBit, that, was, that did a, a service similar to what you did with encrypted email, and they got, um, th they didn't have this plausible deniability, and they had their, their private keys, um, and they got shut down because of this idea that uh, they would not hand over the data. Why did they get shut down and not you? I don't know. I don't know. We, 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 we received a lot of security letters. We were a small company. Maybe they figured it's not worth it for the high, it's not worth it to create a high profile news event for chasing a small number of national security letters. Well, well they had a fewer users. They have, had about half a million. You said you had about a million? Right. And, and they, I mean, it did, Quite a, quite a stir in the news. I don't, I, don't, I don't know how those decisions are made. We, we just flatly ignored everyone that we got. Nobody ever bothered us. No one ever threatened us. We also had the NSA wanting to put code in our computers, too, and pay us for the extra processing time. <laughs> uh, I just want to comment about as I, as I understand it, they were asked to hand over all the data for all their users, and that's when they shut down their service. Before that, they had received these uh, security letters and had complied with them. Interesting. I know that Edward Snowden's own email company sh decided to shut down rather than turn over anything. But I've, we've never been threatened or, or told there would be consequences for our refusal. Um, excuse me, can I? Yeah, sure. um, uh, you said that uh, we have to control the purpose of... Uh, execution. Uh, of execution. Why also we do not control the target of the information? Because the, the, the value exchange here is you're telling Google, I know you have some magic that makes you a lot of money. And I'll let you continue doing that magic. You don't have to give away your trade secrets. You don't have to give away your customers. And the data that's coming to me is under your control. But if I let you do that, my data has to be only used for those things that you're promising me it's going to be used for. 
I'm not, we're not trying to get the customer to dictate to Google how to run their jobs. They're, we're not trying to let the user influence. If you try and influence them too much on how to run their jobs, they'll say, screw it, I'm not going to do it anymore. So it's just a matter of getting them to respect you a little more and not allow your data to be compromised. That's all I'm trying to solve here. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I just want to...